Are you sitting comfortably? Well then, I'll begin. No, really, I'd like to know, are you actually sitting comfortably? Are you in a state of comfort today? Or is it a case of maybe being in a state of discomfort? Maybe it's that back of yours that's playing up, or your knee or your hip, or another ailment or condition that you regularly have to contend with. Or maybe you're struggling with a serious illness, one that affects you each and every day. It doesn't leave you alone, doesn't give you any respite. How are you coping with that? Or maybe your discomfort, it isn't physical at all. Has life been stressful for you just recently? You know, lockdown has put many of us under immense pressure. If you live alone, how are you coping with the virtual isolation, the confinement, the social distancing? Or have you been anxious about your work, your immediate future prospects, how you'll be able to provide for your family? I think you'd agree that economic pressures surely do rob us of our contentment, don't they? What about those of us who have lost dear loved ones in death? The grief of such a uh, loss is a devastating blow, isn't it? One that we weren't designed for. Now, we may not feel the pain literally on the outside, yet the discomfort, the emptiness, oh, that weighs heavily on the inside. So, can I ask you that question again? Are you sitting comfortably? Well, you, you're probably thinking, well, I was until about two minutes ago, until you started reminding me of all my problems, worries, strifes, anxieties. Well, if that's the case, I sincerely apologise. I was merely trying to underline that all of us in some way, shape or form are in need of comfort. You know, in that regard, we're not alone. In fact, nearly 2000 years ago, a man wrote to some friends of his in Rome about this very matter. And it shows that this has been a problem right the way down through mankind's history. Shall we see what he said? Well, turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 22, uh, where the words are recorded for us in the pages of the Bible by the Apostle Paul. So that's Romans 8, verse 22. It reads there, For we know that all creation keeps on groaning together and being in pain together until now. Well, that's a rather stark first scripture to start off with, isn't it? Every human, all creation on this planet is affected. No matter how tough, how resilient we may think we are, in this regard, we're all equal. And the reasons that make us feel pain, and as our verse says here, literally groan under the weight of that pain, have increasingly got worse over the years to our present day. I suppose you could say that we're now living in times where we need comfort the most. Would you agree with that, brothers, sisters, friends? So the big question is then, is genuine comfort really available? And if it is, where can we go to get it from? Well, the Apostle Paul also wrote to some friends of his in Corinth, and he gave them hope that real comfort was available, but also importantly, where they could get it from. Should we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 and 4. I suppose you could say that this scripture is the theme scripture for this talk. And if ever you're in need of comfort, please do come to this scripture. I think you'll find it a lot of help. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 and 4. It reads there, Praised be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of tender mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trials. We're going to leave the scripture there and we're going to return to it a little later. But from the verse that we just read, we quickly establish that the source of genuine comfort is our God Jehovah. Can we see that? Notice how it calls him the God of all comfort in all of our trials. That in itself is comforting to know, isn't it? There's not a single trial, 
problem, trouble, worry, challenge, obstacle that we've ever, ever, ever suffered that cannot be comfort, comforted by Jehovah. You know, maybe if we're feeling low, we have the tendency to feel that no one else knows what we're going through. So it allows us to wrap ourselves in our sorrow, maybe in the same way as Job or, or Jonah did. Jehovah is clearly expressing to us in this scripture that he not only knows what we're going through, whatever it is and whenever it's been, but he's willing to give us the remedy to comfort us. Do you notice also in that verse that it says that he's a God of tender mercies? That's a lovely phrase, isn't it? Tender mercies. You know, mercy is a wonderful quality on its own. However, uh, with tender mercies, we get a little bit of a, an insight, don't we, into its motivation, how mercy is bestowed. We clearly see that rather than being a matter of principle in the same way as a judge or a king would bestow mercy on someone, Jehovah's tender mercies are offered on the basis of love, genuine sympathy, compassion. That's how our God Jehovah comforts us. You know, there are quite a few ways in which Jehovah can help comfort us. However, we're going to look at one major way in which we can draw comfort in these troubled times that we live in. It's through a channel that is very personal to Jehovah. Shall we have a look at um, the scripture in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19? Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19. And it reads there, Jehovah's Spirit is upon me because he anointed me to declare good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and a recovery of sight to the blind, to send the crushed ones away free, to preach Jehovah's acceptable year. Of course, Jehovah's main comforter is none other than his only begotten and dearly loved son, Jesus Christ. Who does it say from these verses that he was sent to declare the good news to? Well, he went to the poor, didn't he? The captives, the blind, the crushed ones. You know, Jesus understood that the weak, those who were oppressed and downtrodden, they needed love. They needed kindness, mercy, compassion. Why was that? Because the people who were supposed to be giving them guidance and assistance... Well, they were cold, heartless, hateful. The religious leaders of the time, the scribes and the Pharisees, they contemptuously called the ordinary people accursed. They were of little or no consequence whatsoever. They were an inconvenience. They got in the way. Did you know that back then in Jesus' time, a labourer toiled 12 hours a day six days a week. That's a 72 hour week. It's a long week, isn't it? And usually that was just for one denarius for the whole day. Now, it's, it's hard to compare ancient wages with those of modern times, but one way is to consider purchasing power, what your money can buy, it just as a comparison. So this isn't accurate at all, but it just gives us a rough idea. Um, in Jesus' day, uh, a loaf of bread made with four cups of um, the flour costs about one hour's pay. Okay, So if we take minimum wage in this country, I've checked it, it's around about £8.72 minimum wage. That's for an hour. Then when you think about it, you work for an hour to get £8.72 to buy your bread. Well, that's an awfully expensive loaf of Hovis then, isn't it? Of course, other brands are available. But would you pay £8.72 for a loaf of bread? The cup of wine, and remember we're talking about a region that would be used to producing wine, well that would cost two hours pay. That's over £17 for a cup of wine. It better be good wine for that money, wouldn't it? You can see from such details that people at the time, they toiled long and hard 
just to keep living, just to keep surviving. They needed relief. They needed refreshment, just as we do today. You know, Jesus saw this. When he spoke to people, he reached their hearts. He addressed their needs. He helped the weak and consoled the depressed in a physical manner, of course. But even more than this, he assisted many to reach their spiritual potential. That's what he was focused on, wasn't he? As a result of this, they found res uh, relief from the stresses of their time. You know, some beautiful words that encapsulate the refreshment that can be received from Jesus are in an invitation by him. Will you turn with me to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30? The invitation was to the people of his time, but it's also been extended to us too. So it, it does well for us to have a look at that, doesn't it? Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. And it reads there, Come to me, all you who are toiling and loaded down, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am mild-tempered, lowly in heart, and you will find refreshment for yourselves, for my yoke is kindly and my load is light. How could you resist that invitation? You simply wouldn't want to, would you? To be refreshed by such kindly and mild-tempered host as Jesus is. But did you notice something from these verses? They say something which is a little confusing, maybe, on, on first, um, uh, first look. A bit counterintuitive. He asks us to take on a yoke, his yoke. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't a yoke something you put on a beast of burden to engage in some hard or strenuous activity? How could this possibly refresh us? Well, incredibly, this yoke that Jesus talks about does exactly that. It refreshes us. That's what makes this invitation so appealing, so interesting, so intriguing. And notice that Jesus doesn't ask us to take the yoke upon ourselves and do all the work alone, does he? We're to get under the yoke with him to share the load. Isn't that comforting to know? To be refreshed in that way by such a host. But did you know that Jehovah can't give comfort to all people? Why is that? Is there a comfort shortage maybe? No, not at all. It's plenty of comfort to go around for everybody. Okay, so is it because Jehovah is unable to cope with the sheer number of people who need comfort? He said that in you know, in every in some shape or form, all of us need some type of comfort. No, again, not in the least. Jehovah is all powerful, and he could cater for the whole world's population's request simultaneously for comfort. So it leaves us asking the question then, why can't all mankind be comforted? Well, the answer lies in the title of this talk, which is trust in the God of all comfort. Do you notice the prerequisite there? You're not eligible for comfort unless in God you trust. Trust in Jehovah is the root to our gaining comfort. And really, there's never been a greater need to trust him than right now. An invitation has been offered by Jehovah to put our trust in him. It's up to us to act. How can we do so? Well, one fundamental way is to put faith in the ransom sacrifice. Will you turn with me uh, to the Apostle John's words in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2? 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Let's see what he says there. Beautiful words from Apostle John. He says, My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not commit a sin. And yet, if anyone does commit a sin, we have a helper with the Father, Jesus Christ, a righteous one. And he is a propitiatory sacrifice for our sins, yet not for ours only, but for also for the whole world. 
we have a helper in case we commit a sin. Aren't we glad of that? Jesus Christ has access to the throne of his father, Jehovah God, on our behalf. You know, if we make a mistake, we commit a sin and we've sincerely repented and confessed and turned around from that sin. Jesus pleads on our behalf and he presents the merit of his sacrifice, his own shed blood. And that will cover over our sins. Otherwise, in Jehovah's eyes, we are as good as dead. Do you see that? Jesus is our own personal negotiator on our behalf. He negotiates with his father to allow us to worship him in an acceptable manner. Does that give us comfort? Thinking about the most valuable free gift that you will ever receive. You know, I was thinking about free gifts the other day. Uh, and usually they have strings attached. And as far as I can see, they fall into three categories. Maybe I'm wrong, but this is how I saw it. <laughs> Firstly, the free gift that really has no value. Now, those of a certain age will remember the, the little plastic toy that used to get in the cereal packets. Remember that? Um, how long did those plastic toys last for? Hours? Minutes? Before they broke? Or they got lost or whatever it may be? So that's your first free gift. But then you get the free product, but you just get a tiny, tiny, tiny little sample. Maybe you've been given a fragrance, perfume or aftershave spray sample. And you're thinking, one little spray and was that it? Did anything, anything come out? See what I mean? Tiny little sample, tiny free gift. Then sometimes you do get a good quality free gift, maybe an umbrella or something like that. Uh, and when you think about it, you've had to buy the whole luggage set or other products to get that free gift. You know, it's been bundled into the price. Strings attached, maybe. You know, in Satan's world, nothing is for free. With Jehovah, you get the 100% fully functioning daily supply of ransom sacrifice, 100% free of charge, no strings attached. You know, another way to show our trust in Jehovah, uh, the God of comfort, is to follow the examples of the faithful ones and imitate their faith. You know, we're not going to do him justice, but we're going to look very briefly at the Bible character Job. He was a great example in this regard and a man whose life really got turned upside down, didn't it? What happened to him? Well, firstly, he suffered economic hardship when he lost most of his possessions. He felt a pain of loss when all 10 of his children were killed by a windstorm. Parents, can you feel his pain right now? He then experienced a serious and very painful illness. You know, it's hard enough to contending with any issues when you're fit and healthy. But when you're ill, when you've got something that's really bringing you down. You know, Solomon rightly said that when you're low, your strength is meagre. You lose your heart for the battle. Even his own wife pressurised him into turning away from God. And close companions, the ones he would depend on, what did they do? Well, they said things that were hurtful, unkind, untruthful. Well, I know a lot of us have got problems, but how are your problems stacking up against Job's at the moment? Especially considering the turnaround events in his life. And the fact he didn't know it would end. How did he endure? Well, let's remind ourselves of his words in Job 14, verse 7, shall we? Let's look at Job 14, verse 7. So, Job says there, For there is hope even for a tree. If it is cut down, it will sprout again, and its twigs will continue to grow. We can see that Job was using the tree in this verse as a metaphor for himself, wasn't he? He saw beyond the pain that he was feeling. And even if it went so far that he should die, he was sure that God, if he so desired, would bring him back to life again. 
Could we maybe adopt a little of Job's attitude, his approach, his mentality, and let it govern the way that we look at the problems that we have? You know, another way that proves our trust is by enduring trials. I'd just like to read to you an experience from a brother called Fernando Marin, who spent 10 years in prison in Franco, Spain. Now, this is from the Watchtower 1985, October the 1st. Um, many of you have heard it before. Um, it's a lovely experience, wonderful experience. Horrible circumstances for Brother Marin, but um, a wonderful experience nonetheless. So I'd just like to read that to you. I was put in solitary confinement and all my belongings were removed, including my Bible. I was only briefly allowed at night, uh, out at night to empty my latrine and to pick up my supper bowl. Yet in all those months of solitary confinement, I was never truly alone. One Sunday, my meal included a slice of lemon. As I squeezed it onto the rice, some drops fell on the red tile floor of my cell, leaving a slight stain. This gave me the idea of using lemon juice to inscribe a text on the cell floor. Once a week, the meal included a slice of lemon. Thus, little by little, I was able to write across the floor of my cell, El nombre de mi Dios es Jehovah. The name of my God is Jehovah. Those words were a constant reminder that I was not entirely alone. Later, using wax from a candle, I polished the whole of the cell floor until it was smooth and shiny like a mirror. You have to remember that bit. Brothers in prison nearby heard about my isolation and the fact that I was denied any Bible literature. By means of another prisoner who was being transferred, they managed to send some pages from a Watchtower magazine and a copy of one of the Gospels. The problem was, how could they get them to me whilst I was in solitary confinement? That night, when I went to empty my latrine, a small package was dropped over the lavatory wall. I grabbed it like a starving man grasping bread. Back in my cell, I spent the night reading those pages again and again and again. It was the first literature, speaking of Jehovah, that I'd seen in a year. The following night, as I returned to my cell with my supper bowl in my hand, I saw the prison commandant, Don Gregorio, waiting for me. He had a menacing look on his face and his short bull neck swelled with rage. In his hand were my magazine pages. My precious Bible literature had been discovered. Using gross insults against Jehovah's name and threats of death, he called me over. I immediately offered an intense and silent prayer to Jehovah, asking that he help me to bear what was to follow with the dignity of a true Christian. The commandant opened my cell door. I ran to the corner of the cell and tried to cover up my vulnerable parts against the onslaught that I knew must come. Furious and screaming, with his eyes bloodshot, he hurled himself at me. The floor was highly polished. He slipped and fell on his face. While with rage, he tried to get up. As he did so, his eyes fell on the words written on the floor. El nombre de mi Dios es Jehovah. He was very superstitious. When he got to God's name, he said incredulously in a low tone, Jehovah. Then his vo voice rose as he began shouting again and again, Jehovah, Jehovah. Then almost on all fours, he fled from the cell. I was spared a thrashing and he never bothered me again. This experience strengthened my faith in Jehovah's protecting hand. Here I was, totally alone and yet not abandoned. I was persecuted, but not destroyed. Did you enjoy that, um, that experience, brothers and sisters? You know, Brother uh, Marin later quoted 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through to 9. Shall we turn to those verses to see what it says there and what inspired him so? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through to 9. It reads there, however... We have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the power beyond what is normal may be God's, and not from us. We are hard-pressed in every way, but not cramped beyond movement. We're perplexed, 
We're not absolutely with no way out. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are knocked down, but not destroyed. Lovely scripture, isn't it? Jehovah says that he will give us power beyond what is normal. Now, rather than remove a trial, Jehovah may choose for us to, to face it head on. Now, that may scare us, but it will supply power beyond what is normal so that we can endure it. You know, there are thousands of examples like that of Brother Marine, which show that this really does happen. And I'm sure, although they were terrified at the time, they were truly glad of that opportunity to prove their trust in their God, to stand up and be counted, if you like. Remember, as James said, this tested quality of your faith works out endurance. So uh, trust in Jehovah manifested in just the few ways that we've looked at helps us to be comforted in these difficult last days. Jehovah truly does comfort those who trust in him. But, you know, he's not the only one to do the comforting. Turn with me back to our theme scripture, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4, where we started reading earlier. Let's have a, have a look at it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And I'll read it from the beginning again. It says, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of tender mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trials, so that we may be able to comfort others in any sort of trial with the comfort that we receive from God. Do you see that? We're here encouraged to imitate our God Jehovah and to help to comfort others in their trials. You know, our problems may seem like a lead weight around our necks, weighing us down. But there's something quite therapeutic, isn't there, about helping others. It helps us to put our own problems into perspective and maybe just at the back of our minds, even just temporarily. But when you think about it, this arrangement we have via Zoom is our new relocated comfort centre in place of our Kingdom Hall, isn't it? This is the place to give and to receive comfort and support to our fellow believers. You know, if you're feeling low, you're feeling tired or depressed in the coming weeks or months, please do connect and take advantage of the comfort that's on offer here. It's very, very real. You know, Jehovah our God has given us abundant evidence of his love for us. His word, the Bible, gives us comfort and hope by remembering the faithful and uh, men and women of old. He sent his dearly loved son, Jesus Christ, to earth as a comforter for those who need it most. All he asks of us is to trust in him and then we can benefit from that comfort. In this dangerous, difficult world of critical times, aren't we so grateful to have benefactors so keenly interested in our physical emotional and our spiritual health. Shall we turn to our final scripture? It's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 16 and 17 and it just gives us ample evidence of this fact. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 16 and 17. It reads there, Moreover, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave everlasting comfort and good hope by means of undeserved kindness. Comfort your hearts and make you firm in every good deed and word. You know, plainly and simply, Jehovah God and his son Jesus Christ, they love us. They desperately want to offer us everlasting comfort. No more aches and pains, no more infirmity. No more anxieties and stresses of life for us. No more grieving for lost loved ones. So, can I ask you that question I asked at the outset? Are you sitting comfortably? Well, I hope you're sitting slightly more comfortably now. And if so, that's good. That's probably because you have put your trust in the God of all comfort.